Welcome to On Texas Football. I'm Bobby Burton, your host, joined by Jerry Hamilton of On Texas Football. We have a special guest today, uh, Greg McElroy of Always College Football. You can find him on podcast or YouTube. That's Always College Football. He's also uh, a longtime uh, contributor uh, to ESPN, calls games, goes on the road for them. Greg, uh, welcome into the show. We appreciate you coming on, buddy. No, it's great to be with you guys, man. Uh, I always like Texans helping other Texans, so uh, this is this is fun, and um, it's always a, it's always a pleasure. So I appreciate you guys having me. Well, you haven't always helped other Texans. There is this little matter of a, a national championship game. We won't go into too much. Where, uh, despite some rib injuries you may have had, uh, you led the the uh, Crimson Tide to win over the Longhorns, but uh, you did win a state championship at South Lake Carroll. Uh, so there is that to be considered as well. In, in all seriousness, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Jerry and I have, have followed your career, not only on the football field, but post that. And congratulations to everything uh, that you've accomplished in your life. Uh, also welcoming in a new kiddo uh, into the fold uh, this past month as well. Hey, hey Greg, let's, let's just start it off. Uh, you had a conversation with Steve Sarkeesian uh, earlier this week. Uh, Jerry and I both watched it and thought it was uh, you know fascinating, some of the things you went through. What were some of your key takeaways in that conversation? Well, I mean, this is really the first year that uh, universally, like last year, people putting Texas in their top seven, eight, ten, wherever they had them was somewhat controversial. Um, people say, well, Texas, here we are again. You know, Texas will they'll wet the bed, you know, what have you. I was pretty convinced last year just looking at the roster and just knowing Sark that they were going to have a good team, uh, a really good team. and didn't quite expect them to be among the best teams in the sport. I had them seventh going into the season last year and everyone was telling me how crazy I was, but I kind of look at them and, and I don't feel like last year's team had to operate with the same level of expectation that this year's team is going to have to operate with. So I was really interested in kind of hearing his approach there, uh, hearing about the transition from the big 12 to the sec and how he's been preparing the roster for that transition for quite some time. Um, positions of significance, I think wide receiver, which is a position group that he clearly feels very good about with the additions they've made in the portal. Uh, hear how they're going to hopefully fill the voids of the two defensive tackles uh, with Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy. I thought Byron Murphy was the best player I've seen in a Texas uniform in a really long time um, and was drafted uh, appropriately where he got drafted. Um, having seen some of the best Texas teams up close as a player and really growing up in Dallas Fort Worth and growing up a Longhorn fan, like Byron Murphy is probably among the best I've seen in this generation of Texas players. Uh, probably since Earl Thomas. I don't know if I've seen a guy that impacted the game as much on that side of the ball. So um, really going to be interesting to see how they transition, but I think the schedule sets up pretty nicely for them. I think they'll go to Michigan, get an opportunity to kind of showcase what they can do. Um, and I just kind of wanted to talk to them about a few of those things as well. The big bugaboo last year was the secondary. Uh, I kind of referenced it in the interview. I thought it was a bit of, it's a bit of low hanging fruit, uh, because I don't think they were as bad as the numbers would indicate. It just, when you look at the numbers, people got an automatic throw-a-thons and they couldn't run it, so they had to get one-dimensional. And as a result, their pass defense didn't look as good. Um, but I think they're in a good position to make another run this year. And I think in some ways, this team might actually be better than last year's. Uh, Greg, I agree with that. I actually think they're going to be a better team. I think they've just recruited so much speed. Another top five recruiting class, what a blue blood can do in the portal. I think they're actually going to be a faster team as a whole, one through 85 than they were last year. Uh, and I've said that. I agree with you. I think they may be a better team because of edge rush this year. Uh, but, Greg, you brought up something that I thought was so interesting that you really have a true point of view on on, on multiple levels. You play quarterback at Southlake. You play quarterback at a Blue Blood with the expectations of winning a national championship. Quinn Ewers left his senior year of high school, and I've always said he missed a huge year in terms of growth being a leader of a high school football team, a community with expectations, and everything that goes along with that. And he goes up to Ohio State, and he kind of disappears for a year. So I think he, from a development standpoint, and then he was hurt a lot before it, it, his, that junior year before he went to Ohio State. But I think he missed a lot from a leadership development voice standpoint 
Where do you come on on that? Because you kind of addressed that with Sark a little bit and that maturation he's had to go through and maybe how it set him back a little bit. Well, I think there's some realities of the NIL era and Quinn kind of being, I don't want to say the poster child, but certainly among the poster children um, where you're given the keys to a Lamborghini right out of the gate. And it's like, okay, well, what, you know, I'm already good, clearly. Y'all right. are compensating me accordingly, clearly. Like, what do I have to work for? And then you realize, like, hang on a second. These guys are really good. Like, I'm going to have to, if I want to get on the field, I'm going to have to get better. I'm going to have to improve. And I think he made that transition really after year one to year two, where it's not that he didn't work hard his first year at Texas. I just don't think he understood the additional preparation that needed to be done to be a high-level college quarterback. I think he thought, hey, I got talent. I know I can throw it. Um, I'm a gifted player. Like I'll figure it out. And then he realized, well, my gifts can only take me so far. I'm going to have to do additional things off the field, whether it's adjusting my diet, uh, being more mindful of how much sleep I get, um, being more of a professional, and, and knowing that I'm really only as good as the guys I surround myself with on – the offensive side of the football, I need to elevate them as well and make them feel like they can walk on water before we break the huddle every single time. And I know that huddle's an archaic concept, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that those were areas of growth. And I think when you listen to Sark talk about his maturation, it's like he became, like most guys coming out of high school, he was kind of a me guy. Hey, I, I got to protect mine. I'm going to go. I got to cash into my NIL. I'm going to go to Ohio State. Then he got to Texas, was like, okay, I'm supposed to be the guy, but I'm not ready to be the guy. Like, I'm supposed to be a freshman in college. Like, these guys don't know me. I don't know them. Like, this is just uncomfortable. And the first year kind of left something to be desired. And then this past year, it's like he made huge commitment in the offseason to be a better player, a more well rounded player, more decisive with his decision making, better understanding and grasp of where the ball's supposed to go, better understanding of defense. And hey, when the defense is aligned like this, that receiver is not an option. And I think now it's about, hey, now I got to elevate the guys around me because I don't have Xavier Worthy. I don't have Jordan Whittington. The guys that have been there for 100 years, I'm the only guy that's been there 100 years now. <laughs> I need to get the new guys on board with me, whether it's Isaiah Bond, Nye Black, uh, Golden uh, from, from Houston and from Oregon State, like all Silas, getting everybody on board. And I'm the guy that everyone's looking to as opposed to sharing that responsibility with a bunch of other veterans in the offensive huddle. So uh, I think that's been really, really important. And um, I also think that it was probably eye-opening too when he got to Ohio State. I think he lost his swagger a little bit and tried to overcompensate. And this is just my observations. You know, in high school, you're the man, right? Yep. Like if you get recruited to Ohio State, Texas, like you're the man. Everyone thinks you're the you're the you're the greatest player ever, right? You're the just a uh, uh, just a just a star in your own community and you go to Ohio State and you're the scout team quarterback you're getting rolled like you're running plays against defensive alignments that aren't supposed to work and you're throwing picks and all this other stuff and it's like I lose my confidence as a player um and then you go out there in the spring at a new place and you're supposed to be the savior it's like well I you know I'm not the savior. I don't feel like I'm a great player yet. Like I just got crushed all fall and now I'm supposed to be this program savior. Like that's not going to work. And then you fast forward to this next year and started to make some progress and feels like the sky's the limit now moving forward. So I think it's understandably natural for a guy with that level of expectations coming out of high school to have a maybe dip and then now peak as he's heading into year number four out uh, of high school at the college level. Speaking with uh, Greg McElroy of Always College Football and ESPN. Uh, Greg, my, before we get into Texas moving to the SEC, and you have the, you actually have felt that, you know, you play in the SEC. I want to get that, you know, a, a former player's perspective of what that really means moving from the Big 12 to the SEC. But before I do that, I want to finish uh, on Texas in particular and ask you about Steve Sarkeesian. What is it about Steve Sarkeesian that you think is good? What does he need to work on? What are the things that make him unique, maybe in that conference even, uh, in some ways, with the way he goes about coaching and play calling, et cetera? Well, I think he's a great coach. Um, I mean, no doubt about it. You're benefited by what job you have. Uh, there's no doubt. Texas is a great job with the resources that they have in NIL. Like, if they want a player, they can go get them. 
Uh, they have tremendous support and they have tremendous alignment. I think Chris Del Conte is one of the best ADs in the country um, who handles a lot of the things as far as fundraising that that would normally fall on the head coach and Sark isn't responsible for that. So like, there's a lot of benefits to where he's at first and foremost. But I think he's a great offensive mind, does a great job of setting up formationally ways to get his best players involved. I think he understands the dynamic of making a quarterback feel comfortable. I think he's excellent in making sure that all the playmakers in the offensive arsenal get touches early in the game to get them involved in the game. Uh, I also think he's a lot more committed to the run than people realize. Um, granted, you're only as good as your players. And when you have Bijan and JB and Jonathan Brooks last year, that's a pretty good place to start running the football. Um, so I think they're in a pretty good spot with what they have offensively. I think his development is now, all right, we have great offense. We know we're going to be great on offense. As long as I'm here, we're going to be great on offense. How do I make sure that the defense is getting the same level of attention as the offense. And I think a lot of people have struck as have maybe battled with this from time to time. Last year they took tremendous strides playing better and better in the third and fourth quarter. That was a big challenge early in his tenure. It's like, man, they'd come out of the gates like wildfire and they have a 21 point lead. Next thing you know, that lead would evaporate because their guys would exhale offensively and the defense would get passive and conservative. And all of a sudden they start making plays and all the momentum's on the other side and they'd lose the game. Um, so I think there have been great progress made with finishing as well as they've started. That was an area of concern that is no longer one for me. And then I think, too, um, I think he's done a great job of maintaining coaching continuity. Uh, I mean, you just don't see it very much. I mean, Pete Kwiatkowski, you would think Pete Kwiatkowski at this point would have head coaching opportunities. Now, you lose Bo Davis, and it does happen. I mean, you're going to lose some guys. But for the most part, he's had his core uh, there from the beginning in his time uh, when he started there at Texas. So I, th I think he's done a really good job. I think the world of him, and I think he's the perfect guy with the understanding of what it's going to take to win in the SEC to lead Texas into this new era. I was going to say, so Greg, what is in front of Texas with that move? I think that's the question. So here, here is from the Texas fans' point of view over the years. The SEC all is overrated. It's top-heavy. Okay, that's the conversation when you're not part of the SEC. Now, when you move into the SEC, what's really in front of Texas in this football program and a fan base with their expectations on a week to week basis? Well, let me tell you, the SEC is not overrated. Um, any coach will tell you it's a war. And the, the SEC is a little different now. Let's just be real. With NIL, talent is spread out a little bit more than it once was. But I can remember when I was in school in particular, um, every single team had two defensive linemen that were going to play 10 years in the NFL. Every team didn't matter. Like it, it didn't matter if it was Vanderbilt. Uh, it didn't matter if it was even a bottom feeder. Like Mississippi State in most of my tenure was not good. But guess what? They had Fletcher Cox, yeah. and you know they they had a couple guys on that D line. It was like, oh my gosh! Like we got Mississippi State this week. We just played LSU. Like this is awful. Um, every single team has multiple first round players. Like every team. Like doesn't matter if South Carolina has the worst roster. In the SEC, they have multiple guys that will play a long time in the NFL. Last year, not a great year, right? But Spencer Rattler was a dang good football player. Xavier Leggett, really, really good. Um, and one of their guys, Juice Wells, who is now at, at Ole Miss, like had he been available, it's probably a different looking roster altogether. Um, I just think like everyone loves Oregon this year, right? Like everyone loves Oregon, you know, top five team coming into the season. Jordan Birch was just an average player at South Carolina and he goes to Oregon. Now he's an all American contender. Yeah. So like this, this is kind of the, the league in and of itself is unbelievably talented. Every team's got dudes and that's the difference. Um, when you play against the likes of some of the teams that Texas has played against in the past, it's no disrespect to the big 12. Um, not every team is going to have multiple NFL top 40 picks. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. Uh, so there's going to be some games where if Texas shows up and plays poorly, they can still win. Uh, but now in the SEC, Texas shows up, plays poorly, probably going to lose. And, and that's, I think one of the challenges of playing in this conference is that everybody can get you 
And that has not always been the case in other conferences. Uh, and partly because everybody in this conference has players that can elevate their play and take over a game. Um, so I think that's part of it. I also think that the league in general is remarkably physical. Um, I don't know if it's as physical as it once was. I mean, it, this used to be the ultimate line of scrimmage league. Now it's become a little bit more skill-based, a little bit more quarterback, wide receiver, defensive line-based. Uh, whereas back in the day, it was really offensive line versus defensive line. I think the Big Ten has taken that mantle now where it's really totally line of scrimmage. And the SEC has gotten a little bit more wide open and a little bit more athletic. But at the same time, I mean, what wins and loses games is ultimately going to be how you protect offensively on the offensive line, how you rush the passer, and how you pitch and catch. Uh, that's kind of what wins in this league. And I think Texas is well positioned, but I can promise you this, the gauntlet that they're going to have to run is going to be a whole heck of a lot more difficult. I'm not going to describe I just kind of I'm not going to look at the Big 12 and go team by team and tell you, well, that's an easy win. That's an easy win. That's an easy win. I just don't think you're going to show up in the SEC and be able to play your C game and still win comfortably. You better you better show up and play your BB plus game if you want to win comfortably. I, I tell you what, that's one of the things we talk about uh, here on on Texas football, Greg, is, you know, we talk about Kentucky being an ultimate trap game for Texas. Yeah, because they they're going to be good on defense. That's Mark Stoops has got bringing a first round draft pick on the defensive line. Mm -hmm. He's got Baron Brown at wide receiver. They've got guys. It's it's not the same as necessarily going to Kansas where they may have one guy in the top 50 in the draft. Kentucky's going to have four or five guys on defense that they're going to end up playing in the NFL. So Quinn Ewers is going to be tested for. That's just, it's natural. And so those trap games become, you know, instead of being able to get by with a B minus performance against a BYU, like Texas did this past year, I think. Yeah. Um, they give a B minus performance against Kentucky. And all of a sudden you're looking at an L that's just totally unexpected. All right. I want to ask you uh, about the SEC as a whole and then your view on college football, because we only got you for a couple more minutes. How do you break down the SEC this coming year and then college football in general? Uh, who do you think are the top four or five programs in the country? Uh, well, we'll start with the SEC. I, I think it's all tiers. At this point of the offseason, I always try to kind of base them on tiers, and it's kind of in flux. The top three are pretty obvious for me in the SEC. Whatever order you want to go in, it's it's Georgia, Texas, Alabama. Whatever order you want to go in, those, those three have kind of, I think – accelerated to the top um, based on personnel, coaching, all those other things. And I understand that that Alabama has a new coach, but I look at the track record that Kalen DeBoer's put together, his record against ranked opponents. Um, that guy's done more with less for a long time. I'm not worried about him at all. So those three I would put at the top. I look at the next tier is the I think the playoff contender tier. I think the playoffs are expected in the top three. I think the next tier is the playoff contender. So... I look at Tennessee, Ole Miss, Missouri, um, LSU. The, those would kind of be the four that would be in the next tier where they can beat any of the top three. They can lose to the next tier. But I think for the most part, you're going to have teams that are in the vicinity of nine and three, 10 and two, eight and four, depending on how the ball kind of kind of bounces. I'd include Oklahoma in that group. Um even though they're new, so it's it's still a little bit of a, of a thought process for me to include them. I would include them in that group as the dangerous, hey, could cycle up and surprise group. Um, but they would probably be at the lower end of that group because I still have question marks about their offensive line. And that is not a position where I want to be. Uh, that's not a position where I want to have question marks in the SEC. Uh, I can live with them not being elite. But I cannot live with them being a liability. And at this point, I cannot tell you without a shadow of a doubt that their offensive line won't be a liability. Uh, so that's the next group. Then the group after that, I can describe them as the dangerous group. Uh, that would be Texas A&M at the top. Super dangerous. Could very easily join the second tier if the opportunity presents itself. Auburn, uh, I think, is really, really dangerous. Kentucky uh, is very, very dangerous. And then I would go as far as to include a team like Florida. In this group now, everybody focuses on Florida and they look at Florida and they're like, oh, well, their schedule's too tough. They'll be lucky to win four. I'm just telling you, we talk about dudes. 
Florida's got dudes. They always have dudes. And they're going to have guys this year that can elevate their level of play. No one seems to talk about the fact that their quarterback is one of the most efficient in the league last year. No one wants to talk about the fact that the defense is likely going to improve from what they were last year with based on a couple of additions and a couple of guys that have progressed off in the offseason. Offensive line should be just fine. Wide receiver was a one-man show last year. Now I think they might spread the ball around a little bit more. I think Florida is going to be a lot I'm not saying that they're a team that wins the SEC, but I don't think they're a team that wins three games either, like some people are projecting. Then you have the bottom tier, which is whatever order you want to kind of assume. That'd be Mississippi State, South Carolina, Arkansas, and Vanderbilt. So it's all kind of tier based and that's kind of the, it's four tiers and that's depending on how well you play in a game you might win, you could join the tier above you or below you depending on some of the outcomes. Good stuff, Greg. Uh, top before we let you go, the top three right now, maybe that you think in the uh, college football playoff real picture: Ohio State, Oregon. What what do you got? Yeah, top three. If I if I were to put them down right now, I'd go Ohio State one, Georgia two, Texas three. Um, that would probably be the order I'd I'd have them in at the moment. Uh, I think Ohio State has the most. I, I guess pieces that have come in that I feel really strongly about, including their offense coordinator and chip Kelly. Um, I think their defense can be a top five unit in the country. The addition of Caleb Downs in the back end to go with a really, really, really deep and talented secondary feel great about that group linebacker. They're going to be fine there. I didn't feel like last year's linebacker core was some ridiculous group. I think they were fine. I don't think they'll they're going to have a difficult time replacing them. And then I look at the schedule too. I think the schedule sets up pretty nice. So I have Ohio State one, Georgia. I would have it too. Georgia still to me. I look at their defensive line. I think about the best Georgia teams. And sometimes you have to compare. It's difficult to be Georgia because I'm to compare them against 2021 and 2022. I don't think their defensive line is anywhere near where they were in 2021 and 2022. But I think they're still pretty good on the edges. And I still think they're really good at the second level. And I think even if they do look at the departures of of an elite corner, an elite safety. Javon Bullard at safety was amazing last year. They're still going to be fine, I think, in the back end as well. So I think George is going to be good. And then offensively, they're stacked. Uh, really, really good on that side of the ball. And then Texas. I mean, the big question marks to me are, how do you replace the defense tackles? Steve Sarkeesian doesn't seem worried about it. So I'm not going to be worried about it. And I look at the secondary and the progress of Manny Muhammad, progress made by Derek Williams, uh, in the back end and their maturity going into year two. Now I expect them to be a whole heck of a lot better. Gilbo being back healthy is huge. So I, I think Texas doesn't have a whole lot of question marks. I mean, at this point, it's all about mitigating risk. And if you're going to put out your top three, you're going to put out your tiers. It's like, I need the teams that I trust at this point. And those are probably the three right now that have the fewest question marks. Everybody's got question marks right now, by the way. There's not a team out there that's like, I know Georgia doesn't think they have any. Ohio State doesn't think they have any. Uh, I think Texas fans are realistic enough to acknowledge that maybe they're not perfect, but we'll see. Um, I look at teams that have the fewest question marks, and those three to me have the fewest. Got it. That's Greg McElroy. Greg, we can sit here and talk to you all day long, dude. You're, you're a pleasure to talk with. I know you got to get running. Uh, always College Football. It's a podcast also available on YouTube as well. Greg. Uh, Congratulations on all your success, including the new baby. I uh, just wish you wouldn't have been so good in 09. Oh, I mean, uh, <laughs> hey, state championship, national championship ring. Pretty good. Pretty good quarterback <laughs> right there. Appreciate right, Greg, McElroy. Me, Greg McElroy, always college football again. Thanks again. Uh, this has been On Texas Football. Welcome.